Hello, uh, welcome to first event of 2022. So this will be a talk by Abhijit sir. And uh, Kailif is very happy to have this event uh, as a starting event of 2022. This event is uh, very close to our heart. And uh, actually there is some, I mean, there is something very special about this event. Nandana, do you know what is so special about this event? Yeah, today's event is actually very special for all of us because uh, we are having both the session chairs and the invited speaker who are batchmates in the Master of Science degree course at the University of Mumbai. And uh, they are also MPTS alumni from the same batch, namely 1996. The invited speaker, Dr. Abhijit Champanekar, is a professor of mathematics at the Department of Mathematics, College of State and Island, and the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, USA. His research areas include geometric topology and knot theory. In this series of two invited talks, he'll be giving us an introduction to the exciting field of mathematics called knot theory. We are really excited to have Dr. Champanekar with us today. A warm welcome to him. Today's session will be chaired by Dr. Ajit Kumar, who is an associate professor and the head of the Department of Mathematics at the Institute of Chemical Technology, Mumbai. Dr. Ajit Kumar earned his PhD in Mathematics and Master of Science from the University of Mumbai. His research areas include optimization and statistical techniques, differential geometry and analysis, mathematical pedagogy, use of computer-aided tools and mathematical software in mathematics. Dr. Ajit Kumar has been associated with MTTS for a very long time, and currently he is the managing trustee of MTTS Trust. We are extremely delighted to have Ajit sir as the chair of this session. So as we have planned to start the talk at 6.15, we would like to hear about your association with Abhijit sir and Jayantan sir. I would now kindly request Ajit sir to take over the session. Thank you, Nandana, and uh, good evening to all. It's really a pleasure to, I mean, introduce Abhijit and chair his session. First of all, uh, uh, thank you to Leaf for inviting Abhijit and uh, uh, me and Jayantan, because as uh, Nandana said, uh, we all three were in the same batch of MTTS and also we had uh, done our MSc together in Mumbai University during 95 and 97. So yeah, I mean, let me briefly uh, say something about Professor Abhijit. So I think let me first take this liberty of saying that uh, Abhijit is also one of the proud alumni of uh, MTTS. First, he attended MTTS in uh, 1995. I was also there. Jayantan attended in 96. So, and after that, he joined Mumbai University for his master's. I'm not sure if many of you know, because uh, uh, let me just uh, tell you, uh, Avijit uh, had cleared uh, actually IIT Bombay MSc entrance exam, and he had stood first in that exam. But he chose to do his uh, MSc from Mumbai University rather than IIT. I don't think many, many uh, students, especially these days would uh, kind of uh, take that as a, as a route. I'm, I'm sure, I don't think he ever reg regrets that uh, decision. Anyway, possibly he will tell us. And after, uh, so, I mean, those two years uh, during MSc, 
you were really wonderful. We had very nice time. All of three of us were actually also staying in the hostel. And so we had really wonderful uh, time during those days. And after uh, uh, MSc, of course, uh, he went to Columbia University to do his PhD. And uh, as was uh, introduced, his research area is North Theory and Geometric Topology. And uh, not, no surprise, he has done very good work in, in that area. He has number of publications to his credit, guided few PhD students, also co-authored a book, and of course, uh, many, many other things. But so uh, second time that uh, we attended, all of us was in 1996 level two program. And uh, exactly after 20 years later, he also taught in MTTS program in 2016 for two weeks. Uh, I think he wanted to do this uh, early, but somehow it's difficult to manage being in US, uh, but he, I'm happy he, he managed once. And uh, we would like him to uh, come more regularly. And especially that uh, we have now uh, during this unfortunate pandemic, the MTTS has also expanded many things and many things are also conducted online. So I'm sure uh, he will uh, definitely have opportunity. I'm sure he will be happy to, to, to do this. So apart from, uh, uh, of course, his uh, brilliant academic uh, career, he's also a very good teacher. In fact, uh, during our MSc, a lot of things we used to discuss together and he used to, uh, many times he used to give lecture. And of course we used to also contribute once in a while, but he's very, very good teacher. That's what uh, I, can, I can say. And of course, uh, his, uh, his uh, wife is also MTTS alumni, uh, Dr. Jyoti Champanerkar. So that's very good. Yeah, so. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, what else to, to say, but I'm really happy that uh, he has finally, uh, I mean, agreed to, to come and give a talk. In fact, the first when the, this curry leaf uh, started and they said that they will invite MTTS alumni uh, to give lectures, the first name that I it occurred to me was Abhijit. So finally, of course, uh, he's here. And I'm sure this is uh, just a beginning. He'll uh, contribute to many more uh, such events. Okay, so uh, I think I'll now invite uh, Professor Abhijit to give his talk. Okay, Abhijit, please go ahead. Maybe you can also tell in the beginning how we all have benefited from MTTS and what is that impact of MTTS uh, on, of course, on you, <laughs> we, we, right? So that would be nice for the all the MTTS alumni that we have here. Okay, Abhijit, please. Thank you, Ajit, for the very generous introduction. And thank you to the Curry Leaf organizers for doing such a splendid job organizing uh, uh, this talk and inviting me to talk. Uh, the, everything about the talk, the coordination with respect to the emailing and uh, making uh, the flyers and also publicizing this event and uh, setting up the YouTube live stream, etc., has been very, very smooth. So I applaud them on their flawless organization. And uh, as Ajit mentioned, um, uh, I also thank Ajit uh, for agreeing to chair this session and also Jayanthan who will uh, chair the session tomorrow. We have really many, many fond memories and the two years uh, uh, during which we were together for our MSc were really one of the best years um, uh, of my life and I'm sure probably their life too. Uh, we were really immersed in mathematics and learning under uh, a great teacher as a uh, and sir, and as I like to say that 
uh, for us, it was much more like uh, having two years of MTTS continuously, uh, rather than just having this four weeks, um, because we were staying in the hostel and uh, we would meet with Sir, uh, he would teach us one or even two classes. And then he would also run these extra seminars uh, where about eight to 10 of us would come and give talks. And uh, it, those, uh, the lessons we learned uh, during that time uh, really uh, help us uh, now uh, when we teach, when we are teachers, the way we think about mathematics and MTTS programs, which we attended. Uh, I attended uh, two of them, one at IIT in Bombay in 95, and then one um, in, uh, in Pune in 96. And those were really instrumental in um, in solidifying my understanding and uh, 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 how to think about mathematics, how to present mathematics, how to discuss mathematics. And especially uh, during these two years, one of the, the most important aspect of mathematics, which it's not obvious when we read mathematics through books, uh, which is the collaborative and the discussion part of mathematics and how important that is. And one of the things of this pandemic, one of the adverse effect is this collaborative part of mathematics where we all meet and discuss that has been affected. So I'm very happy that Curry Leaf is taking this initiative to bring uh, speakers to students, uh, to interest the students and providing some forum for uh, this very va valuable mathematics interaction. So thank you Curry Leaf. So uh, this point, uh, I'm going to start my talk. So Abhijit, before you start, let me just uh, make an announcement. Uh, so during his talk, in case any of you have any question, you may raise your hand and I'll uh, bring that to Professor Abhijit or you may uh, put it in the chat message, including if there are some in uh, YouTube, then we can also take, it. he can also take it. Thank you, Abhijit, please go ahead. Thank you, Ajit. So the topic of my uh, talk today and tomorrow is going to be not theory. Uh, so unraveling knots four perspectives. So I hope to give you four different points of view of approaching knots. Knot theory is a very rich field uh, because of the various uh, interactions uh, and perspectives people have found to approach uh, knot theory. And we will go over uh, some of the, uh, how it originated and how it developed. So. Uh, here is the plan for my talks. Uh, so the first talk, which is today, uh, we'll do some basics of knot theory, uh, knot diagrams, some families of knots, uh, some diagrammatic invariants, uh, the Jones polynomial, and I will show you a couple of different ways to approach the Jones polynomial. In my talk tomorrow, uh, we will uh, we go into the topology and geometry of knots and knot complements uh, and some invariants coming from the topology and geometry part, classical as well as uh, uh, more current. And then we'll look at some generalizations and open problems. So the outline of today's talk, we'll start with knots, uh, some definitions, their diagrams, the origins of knot theory, which are very interesting. Uh, some special families of knots, which we will uh, use in other talk, in, in the talk tomorrow, and also which come keep coming up uh, in uh, studying knots. Then the idea of invariants, uh, some diagrammatic invariants, and a very important conjecture called the Tate conjecture. Then we'll explore uh, uh, some interaction with graph theory, which knots and graphs are very deeply related. Uh, then will come the Jones polynomial and the Kaufman bracket, then graph theory 
and Jones polynomial, in particular spanning trees and Jones polynomial, and then we'll look at some computations, uh, computational software and, and uh, the computational aspect, which is very, very, very much present in knot theory. So notation um, I by SN would be the set of unit vectors in Rn plus one. Uh, we also want to see SN as a one point compactification of Rn. So a knot is an embedding of the circle S1 in S3. So a circle in the three sphere, and sometimes you can also think of it as a circle in R3. So by embedding, we mean a map, a continuous uh, uh, injection of S1 in S3. And similarly, a link of K components is an embedding of a disjoining of K circles in S3. Now, throughout this talk and tomorrow's talk, when I say the word not, I mean not or a link. So the first thing we want to uh, understand is some kind of equivalence because if you just look at injective maps of the circle into three sphere there will be many many uh, maps so we want to understand some kind of equivalence and this equivalence is given uh, by what is called an ambient isotopy which means that we can move s3 uh, continuously so that it takes some one knot k1 to the other knot k2 so uh, a continuous family HT, uh, T uh, in the closed interval 0, 1, such that it starts at the identity um, uh, and H1 uh, takes K1 to K2 and at every level T, it is a homeomorphism. So the goal of knot theory is to uh, classify knots up to this equivalence. And uh, not just theoretically, but actually practically, meaning that if you're given two knots with some description, you should be able to algorithmically decide if they are equivalent or not. And in order to solve this question, uh, there are many, many fields uh, which got involved in knot theory over the years. And as uh, each field kept getting involved, uh, we found uh, different aspects come out uh, of, of uh, the knot theory and also the interaction between these fields uh, on the canvas of knot, knot theory, so as to say. So the four fields which we'll explore is of course combinatorial, which is the diagrammatic aspect, uh, uh, a little bit of uh, quantum uh, uh, invariance, uh, then topology and geometry. So the first thing which uh, we think of when we uh, think of knots is all the pictures which we see. And uh, those pictures of knots are called knot diagrams and they have a, a couple of uh, subtle mathematical properties. So a knot diagram is just a projection uh, of a knot which sits in three space and you project it onto a plane. And uh, the, you have, of course, infinitely many projections. So we want to make sure that the projection is a finite four valent planar graph. But then at the vertices, we can actually indicate the crossing information by just having an overcrossing and undercrossing. Now, uh, because of knot diagrams, knot theory lends itself to drawing lots and lots of pictures. So this stock will involve many, many, many pictures. So um, once you see the pictures of knots and uh, you, it's clear what I mean by projection. The important point is that every vertex is four valent. So that's a regular projection. So these are the usual suspects in knot theory. Uh, most stocks would uh, put up uh, some of these famous knots. Uh, the knot on the leftmost knot is the unknot, which is just the crossingless circle embedding. Uh, in three space. Uh, then the next knot is called the trefoil. Uh, the knot, the one in the middle is called the figure eight because you can see this figure eight sort of drawn over there. Uh, the next link is a link of two components because it has two circles in here, uh, which is, uh, you can see it's indicated by those colors. It is called the whitehead link after the mathematician 
whitehead and the third the last uh, uh, is a very uh, another very symmetric and uh, beautiful link uh, uh, it is called a boromian rings it has three components and of course there are many many knots and we will see many other knots during the talk so before we go on to um, start drawing knot diagrams and do things with it we have to be uh, a little careful so word of caution so we defined the knot as a continuous uh, injection of the circle in three space, but the topological setting uh, is a little too broad uh, because it allows for what are called wild knots. So wild knots are uh, embeddings for which if you try to draw a diagram, it would look something like this. There is some kind of limiting behavior. There is no finiteness. There are no finitely many crossings. Uh, remember a knot projection or a knot diagram is a finite four valent graph so something like this it would be difficult to get a regular projection of this so we want to eliminate uh, this uh, kind of behavior by adding a differentiability condition so uh, we say instead of just a continuous injection we say it's a smooth or a piecewise linear uh, injection of a circle in s3 and the moment you add uh, this uh, restriction, uh, then all of these kind of knots will have knot diagrams. And then of course, the notion of equivalence is also uh, updated uh, to a smooth or a piecewise linear isotopy. And so uh, it's, a, it's a consequence uh, of some theorems in topology and differential topology, which say that if knots are equivalent via this ambient isotopy, then it really does mean that they're isotopic, meaning that one can smoothly deform a knot K1 into the other. Now you could not do this in the topological category because if you just take a knot, you can smoothly, uh, you can continuously pull the knot and make the knot smaller and smaller, eventually just disappearing and just getting uh, a piece of unknotted string. And so uh, this isotopy of knots, meaning just continuously moving one knot to the other uh, is not a good notion if you're just in the topological category. But in the piecewise linear or the smooth category, uh, that it's equivalent to isotopy. And smooth knots have knot diagrams. So uh, meaning fine, they can be represented as finite uh, four valent planar graphs. So uh, the first question which comes up is we now have uh, two representations. One is a continuous map or a smooth map in uh, the three space, and you have a planar diagram. So the question is, how do you determine uh, equivalence of knots from knot diagram? So what happens to this uh, planar equivalence? And that is a, a very famous theorem of uh, Reidemeister and Alexander Briggs, that two diagrams of a knot are related by a finite sequence of moves uh, which are called Reidemeister moves. Now these are local moves. So uh, here is the first Reidemeister move. And all we are doing here uh, is just uh, putting a little twist on a piece of string. Here there is interaction with two uh, strands of the knot and you're pulling one over the other. This is usually called R2. And then uh, this is the third Reidemeister move which involves uh, three uh, strands and we are moving one over the other. And now you can see that all of these three moves, if you imagine this happening in space, they're all isotopies. You're continuously moving uh, a, a knot uh, uh, the strands of knots with each other, uh, always uh, maintaining the bijectivity, meaning that you're not passing the strand through each other. So these are your three uh, Reidemeister moves. And now we know how to relate uh, diagrams, uh, different diagrams of the same knot. When, I'm, when I say the same knot, I really mean the equivalence class of knots. Um, uh, so equivalence class of the smooth embeddings under isotopy. So here is an example. Uh, we have a knot here, and you want to eventually get to the, this diagram of the same knot. And uh, we use this Reidemeister 2 move here. 
this is an R2. As it is said, we are, we are pulling this, this strand. We take this piece of strand over here and we are pulling it uh, here. And now we are just kind of putting it in position in order to use our our uh, third rider master move. So the third rider master move looks for a triangle. So you can see here there is a there is one crossing, second crossing, third crossing. So here is this triangle which we are looking for. And now we are pulling this over the, the pulling this strand over the two crossings. So here is the rider master three move, uh, and there is a triangle involved which is coming through. And now we can just do a rider master one move and remove this little twist in order to get this other diagram. So typically uh, that is how uh, this, uh, this planar isotopy and rider master moves work. But in general, it's, it's tricky to, if you're given two diagrams of, even if you know this is of the same knot, try to come up with a set of rider master moves. Uh, so, for example, the the number of moves uh, is uh, the bounds on the number of moves are also not very well known. So, just something about origins of knot theory. Uh, knots have been appearing in artwork and spiritual symbolism of many cultures uh, throughout history. They are just beautiful objects to draw. And you may recognize some of these pictures. There are some Celtic knots on the left. Uh, this is something called an endless knot, which comes up in uh, Buddhism and uh, and in in Chinese uh, symbolism. Uh, this is uh, something from an uh, some Islamic artwork. And this is, of course, the columns of uh, India. And you can see there are all these four valent graphs and knot theorists like to think of them as knots. Uh, and you'll see in a few slides why. And knots have also made um, a little, get their reference in the Vedas, uh, especially in the Mundaka Upanishad in this very famous mantra, Bhidyate Hridaya Granthi Chidyante Sarva Samshayaha. So this is a very famous mantra from Mundaka Upanishad. And this Hridaya Granthi, uh, Granthi is a knot and it is the knot of the heart. So it makes uh, uh, some kind of reference in the Vedas also. No pictures though. So uh, mathematical study of knots uh, began uh, in earnest uh, in, in the context of topology, which was called the geometry of position. Uh, so in the late 18th century by van der Monde, and in the 19th century by Gauss, uh, who gave this famous linking integral formula. So he, he, took, he, he looked at some uh, parameterizations of a link and try to compute their linking number using an integral. But uh, the, the real sort of in-depth study of knots came uh, later on when uh, these two Scottish physicists, Lord Kelvin and, uh, and P.G. Tate, uh, they were involved in this more study of knot theory. So, uh, this is from uh, Dan Silver's excellent article, Scottish Physics and Knot Theorist Odd Origins. So these two mildly eccentric 19th century Scottish physicists were responsible for modern knot theory. So how so? Uh, in 1867, Lord Kelvin conjectured that atoms were knotted tubes of ether. And so in order to create a periodic table, uh, his friend, uh, the Scottish physicist Tate, Peter Tate, started to study and tabulate knots. And that's a picture of a Tate. Uh, uh, he's, he had been tabulating knots for a long time. So he may look a little frustrated here. And Peter Tate was joined with some other knot theorists as well. Uh, but soon it was discovered that there is no ether. And so physicists really lost interest in knot theory. 
However, uh, this tabulation of knots, uh, which was left behind by Tate and others, continued to thrive and uh, took on its own mathematical form and became knot theory as more and more mathematical techniques uh, started getting used to solve these questions. Uh, and, and physicists came back to knot theory uh, about 1980s with, with quantum topology and so on. So uh, let's see some knot constructions and some knot families. So uh, how do you form new knots from given old knots or given, given knots? So first construction is that of a composite knot. Uh, so J connects some K. Now uh, the composite knot, this connect sum is the same idea as you see in manifolds. So you can connect some surfaces or connect some N manifolds. The idea is that you take two close manifolds and you uh, remove uh, the open balls from them and their boundaries, which are uh, N minus one spheres, you, uh, you glue them together and then you will form a new manifold. So this idea is the same here. Uh, you take uh, these little arcs uh, from here and here, which is uh, basically uh, a one ball, which is an interval, and the boundary is going to be uh, the zero dimensional sphere, which is just going to be the end points. These are the end points. And now you identify the two knots using their end points, like so over here. Right, so you actually get a connect sum um, of two knots. So these are, this is, these are composite knots. And if a knot is not a composition of any two non-trivial knots, then it is called a prime knot. So non-trivial knot, a trivial knot just means the unknot. Just means the unknot, which is the crossingless circle. So let's uh, look at the second construction, uh, which uh, uses two knots in a uh, in a more innovative way. So you take a knot in an unknotted solid torus, like so. This is the knot K1, and this is called a pattern knot. And now you take this solid torus and you knot it in three space, like so. And uh, so there is a pattern knot here, which is which is the knot in the solid torus. And then you take the solid torus and knot it in three space, which is the companion knot, which is K2. And now you look at uh, this image of this K1 inside here. So it has, to, it has some knottedness from itself being in the solid torus. Um, and then it has the knottedness from K2. So this, uh, this type of knot is called a satellite knot. And in case, um, uh, if you just take the trivial knot and put it in the solid torus just by going cabling around, just by going around the solid torus n times, that is called the n cable of a knot. So, uh, so that's equivalent to you take this knot and just draw uh, more copies of itself just around there, but then uh, you kind of do a little bit change to make sure that the number of components stays the same. So if it's a knot with one component, then it will stay a knot. So that's where this little crossing is coming in, just to make sure that the result is a knot uh, with one component. So here is uh, a, a question. If there are no questions from the audience, here is a question for the audience. Are Abhi, composite knots... Avijit, uh, uh, Dr. Somya has raised his hand. Yeah, hi. And yes. also is so is uh, Subham. Samia, please go ahead. Yeah, so you were saying we knot this solid torus. So what is the meaning of yes. knotting a solid torus? How? What exactly is the process? Yeah, so uh, you can think of K two as a smooth embedding of the circle in three space, and if you take a uh, if you just thicken the circle up then the thickened circle is a solid torus. A solid torus is, a, is basically a medu vada or a donut. And, uh, and then that can be mapped exactly like the uh, knot K2. 
is going. So you just imagine, uh, just thicken up this knot K2, and you will see that it's it's like a it's like a thick, um, uh, like a knotted maybe meduad or like a chakli or something, which is going around. And then inside that, there is the knot pattern knot K1, and so you get this knot satellite knot which has which has the pattern of uh, K1 and then uh, it is also has the shape of this K2. So the knot K3 here is actually uh, this inside one, K3. This is the inside knot, not the solid torus. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Shubham has one question. Yeah. Shubham, please Hello, go ahead. Sir. Yeah. Hello, sir. I, I have doubt yes. from the previous page. Yes. So, Do you want me to change to the... Yes. Yes. So, no. No, this is this sorry. one. The the composition of J and K. Yes, that. Yeah. So what 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 the what allows us to join these two lines, which we removed from the two, like from the J, we removed some open part, right? And yes. in K, we removed, and then we are joining one part with the other end and other part with the other end yes you're just joining the two points together yeah yeah so is it this is a continuous uh, deformation right yeah yes yeah well no it is not a continuous deformation because you are you are cutting arcs out so it is not continuous it is just a uh, it's like a cut and paste construction Okay. Yeah, so, you're you're cutting this and you're pasting it, and you can you can uh, may, uh, you can see that uh, uh, the resulting uh, the resulting knot is also uh, a smooth embedding. Yes. Okay. So these these dotted parts are not the part of the. The dotted parts are not there. They are cut. These are these are okay. cut. Okay. You're you're right. Okay. Yeah, this is okay. yeah. th these things are cut out. Yeah. Okay. Out. yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. So I also have a question for the audience. Uh, are composite knots a special case of satellite knots? So we'll see uh, uh, some of the answers to these questions towards the end of the after the end of the talk. All right, so the next uh, uh, special family uh, of knots is alternating knots. So this is a very interesting family and from all perspectives, uh, uh, it's studied uh, in great detail. So an alternating knot, uh, a knot is alternating if it has a diagram whose crossings alternate between over and under as one travels around a knot in some direction. So as you start going, there is an overcrossing here, then undercrossing, overcrossing, undercrossing, overcrossing, undercrossing, overcrossing, undercrossing, and then you come back finally. So uh, that's a that's an alternating knot or an alternating link, uh, link depending on how many components. And a, K, if a knot is non-alternating if it has no alternating diagram. Now note that this is not, this is a difficult problem because there are infinitely many diagrams and uh, uh, even alternating knots will have non-alternating diagrams because simply you take one of the strands and just pull this uh, say under under some of the other strands by like a Rydermeister 2 move. Then this, this diagram becomes a non-alternating diagram, right? So, um, And so uh, alternating diagrams are certainly special. So if you give a knot, uh, how do you know if it has no alternating diagram? So in general, it is not an easy problem to, uh, to determine. The next uh, special family is torus knots. So these are also uh, very uh, wonderful knots because they can be put on the surface of a torus. 
So uh, our, our surface of a solid torus, which is the torus, S1 cross S1. So this torus, uh, it has a meridian like so and a longitude and your, uh, your knot goes a few times around the meridian and a few times around the longitude and comes back and joins itself. So this is a simple closed curve on the torus. Uh, so uh, here is the knot trefoil. This is the trefoil, which is just drawn as a torus knot. So it goes three times uh, around the meridian. Uh, so three, two, torus knot. So three times around the meridian. So how do you check that? So you can see that if you start over here, it is going down and then it comes up. One time it has gone around the meridian. Then it goes second time. Then it comes up. That's the second time it has gone around the meridian. And now it goes down again. And then it has come up. That is the third time it has gotten around the meridian. And similarly, you can check that it is going twice around the longitude. So this is three times meridian plus two times the longitude. And so this is, for example, um, uh, this is a four, three um, uh, torus knot. Uh, so this is going around the meridian four times and three times around the longitude. So in general, uh, the torus knot uh, TPQ goes P times around the meridian and Q times around the longitude. And there's a very uh, nice way to draw this we divide the circle in p points equidistant points and same thing for the outside circle in p equidistant points and now you start at one point and go q steps away so uh, and then join the point so for example this is a this is a 4 3 torus knot and uh, so if you start over here uh, so there are four dots here and now it is going three three dots over so not here but one two and three so this goes like so and there it that is that is so if you start the, if this is zero then this is one two three the same thing when you start over here uh, it is going one two and three you can see that and of course from the below you just join it uh, to to the same the, the equivalent part and so this, uh, if you do it like this, uh, then you can see that it is going P times around the meridian and then Q times around the longitude. So that's a PQ torus knot. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it, it is a link on the torus. So the question is, uh, how many components does uh, the torus knot TPQ have? And how is TPQ related to TQP? So we can discuss Abhi, this. Way. Abhijit, there the are a few, few questions. Yes. <clears throat> First, I think uh, Dr. Shamik has had raised his hand. Shamik? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, uh, hi, Abhijit. Uh, I had uh, one question. This uh, the alternating diagram. Uh, will it be unique? Uh, uh, we will get to that question. OK. Yeah, sure. it, it, it's not unique, but uh, the, the, there is a way in which uh, any two alternating diagrams of the knot are related. Yeah, that was one of the famous conjectures of Tate. He said that uh, any two, uh, there is one more uh, property we need, which is that of reduce. So any two reduced alternating diagrams of the same knot are related by a sequence of a move called flips. So that was called a Tate flipping conjecture, and it was solved around uh, in, in the early 1990s by uh, by uh, Bill Menasco and Marvin Thistlethwaite. Yeah, about 100 years, more than 100 years late, uh, after Tate had proposed this conjecture. But we'll we'll get to that. Uh, we'll get to Tate and his table soon. Sure. sure. Any more questions? Yeah, there is another uh, raise hand. Mahanta, please go ahead. Hi, uh, this is uh, the question regarding uh, that composite row uh, knot that you have said. Yes. Uh, the, so can we put every uh, knot on a solid torus or like, I didn't understand that very well. So. Uh, yeah, so can we put every knot on the torus, uh, which would mean that is every knot a torus knot? And so we have to come up with some way of uh, saying whether these knots are equivalent or not. 
So uh, uh, that comes down to the question of telling knots apart, which we are going to address in some time. Okay. So okay. Uh, yeah, so these are kind of special families, as you will see, the alternating knots uh, or torus knot. They are special families, and there are knots. Uh, we will see later that there are knots which are not alternating. Then there are knots which are not torus knots. There's a way to tell 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 them apart, which we'll get to. Okay. okay. Thank you. That is the <clears> next <throat> slide. Vijay, there is another question from the. Yes. How do we know that satellite knot is a knot? Uh, it is just by construction. When we are constructing it, we are getting a smooth embedding um, of a of a circle in in the three space. That is why it is a knot. Because you are you take the solid torus, you knot it in three space, but then your knot is the image of the pattern knot K1 into the into the corresponding three space. So now you are getting a smooth embedding um, of, a, of a circle in three space. So that is why the satellite knot is a knot. Or again, a knot or a link, I should add. Yeah, okay, please go ahead. So it, it, it comes to this question, um, which Manta asked, uh, if, uh, is every knot a torus knot or is every knot a alternating knot? Well, that that boils down to telling knots apart. So how do we tell knot, uh, knots apart? So here is a, a very simple sort of fam, uh, pair of knots. It is the trefoil, which we saw. And uh, this is uh, what is called the right trefoil. On the right, and this is called the left trefoil on the left. What is the difference between these two? The, the, the crossings are just reversed, right? This, this crossing here, this strand goes up and down and here the other strand is up and the first strand is down. So at every crossing you can see, so these two knots are as four valent graphs, they are the same, but they change in the crossing information in that every crossing is reversed. So, uh, so this is a reflection. So the right, uh, so left trefoil is a reflection of the right trefoil, and uh, these are not equivalent because um, node. Uh, well, that's not trivial to show, and uh, it it takes some work to show that. But note that when we talked about not equivalence, uh, this ambient isotopy which we're talking about is. Uh, uh, is, is homotopic to the identity, so it's orientation preserving. And so um, uh, the, all of this is, the reflections are not allowed. So you cannot just take one knot and just reflect it, and that will not be an amb ambient isotopy. So one has to be a little careful uh, when we are uh, doing with orientations. Uh, so this right and left trefoil are not equivalent. But how do we actually show that an ambient isotopy does not exist? We cannot really go through all ambient isotopies. That's not practical. And so you need the concept of an invariant. So what's an invariant? Uh, it is some function uh, from the set of knots, meaning the, the set of equivalence classes of knots to some, to, to some set X, uh, such that whenever, uh, so, so such that if we know this invariant is not equal, then the knots cannot be equivalent. Uh, so uh, what is this X? Well, it can be, uh, it comes in many, many different flavors. So uh, an in, a not invariant can be a number or it can be a matrix, or it can be a polynomial, polynomial of one variable, polynomial of many variables. Uh, it can be a, a group, it can be a, a module, it can be an algebraic variety. So it has many, many different flavors depending on what perspective you are taking. So, um, so that is the concept of a not invariant. So we have to construct not invariants. So here is the f first sort of simplest not invariant. Uh, which is the crossing number. So you take um, uh, it's a crossing number, which is defined as the least number of crossings that occur in any knot diagram. So you take a knot, you look at all the diagrams and you look at, you minimize that, uh, look at the minimum number of crossings. Uh, but uh, it's a measure of a knot's diagrammatic complexity. But 
uh, you right away see that this is uh, this is tricky. It's tricky because a knot has infinitely many diagrams. So if you get a diagram uh, and you compute the crossing number, that's only an upper bound. So you need this lower bounds in order to make sure you actually have the correct crossing number. Uh, so one way to kind of resolve this problem is to start tabulating knots. You start with uh, knots with zero crossings, one crossing, two crossings, and so on, and try to use Rydermeister moves uh, or some kind of isotopy to make sure that your knot has not occurred before. So this is what, what Tate uh, uh, and his collaborators did. So this motivated by this vortex is an ether theory of Lord Kelvin. They set out to make a periodic table of elements uh, like we have in chemistry. But since uh, elements were this vortex, uh, knotted uh, uh, vortices and ether, if you classify knots or tabulate knots, you will get a periodic table of elements. So that was the motivation why they started doing that. And they enumerated knots using the crossing number and they found 249 prime knots up to 10 crossings and some more about 300 some prime alternating knots up to 11 crossings now this was all done by hand uh, so it was it was quite formidable here is a piece of uh, uh, tate's uh, knot tables and uh, we saw we have this unknot right here and we have the trefoil right here we have the figure eight knot and it goes on there so uh, if you say, well, what about one crossing and two crossings? State left out, uh, I forgot, one and two crossings. Well, if you look at um, a one crossing, uh, you can close it up in two ways. You can close it up like this, but that is going to be just the unknot because that's a Rydermeister one move. Or you can close it up uh, like this, and that is also the same sort of picture. You can, again, um, this is just the same thing as unknot. This is also the same thing as unknot using just the Rydermeister one move. So, so you get a diagram and then you make sure that there are no ways to uh, simplify it, isotope it, uh, make it uh, using some moves uh, and make sure that it is not replicated or it is not occurring uh, in the list before. So that's the way they kind of uh, tabulated or over, over 500 or over 600 knots. Uh, so this was uh, started by Tate and then it was later joined by K Kirkman and then Little um, and they worked over 25 years to get this table of knots. This was about um, uh, 100 years ago, well not 100 now but maybe about 140 years ago and now with the current technology and the invariants which we have and using computers uh, we can, uh, so in, in about uh, July 2003, about 120 years later, after Tate and Kirkman and Little started the tables, uh, Rankin, Flint and Sherman tabulated over 6 billion knots, uh, alternating knots through 22 crossings in just over a day and a half of computer time. So they must have used some supercomputer clusters or something. And then um, you generate knots using certain sort of codes and then try to check um, uh, if they are if they are uh, equivalent or not. I should note that when I say knots here, it really means uh, knots with one component, meaning uh, just S1, uh, not links. But also note that, you know, after about 120 years, they did it for 11 crossings and we are only doubled the crossings. We have just done for 22 crossings. There are of course, lots and lots of knots and lots of data. Uh, so this is a very, another very nice article about enumeration and classification of knots and links. Abhijit, uh, Abhijit uh, there is one or two questions from the YouTube viewers. Yes. One is uh, from uh, Brunal, she is asking, King, uh, how prime knots will look like? Yeah, that is a that is a good question. So, uh, a prime knots uh, look uh, well. We we have to answer it by the absence of something. So, if you have some kind of a composite knot, if you have knot K1 and K2, uh, so if you take a diagram for instance, then you have this circle which intersects the knot in, in two points. 
So whenever you have a circle which intersects a knot in two points, and of course, um, uh, it encloses something non-trivial, not just an arc, uh, then uh, we have a composite knot. So a prime knot means that if you have this, this sort of configuration, then your K2, uh, this part, is, is, is just going to be uh, an arc. It's just going to be an arc. So that's, that's a prime knot. There is another question uh, from, yeah. again, from uh, just, Mahanta. Just one minute. Let, yeah, let, sure. Let me just add to this. So this is uh, for a diagram in the plane. But if you ask what happens in three space, then there is a two sphere, uh, which, uh, which uh, intersects uh, this not in three space in exactly two points. And if that happens, then whatever is enclosed in this, in this two sphere is just one strand like this. Then the knot is prime. So uh, that's a, so so a, a knot is prime if every two uh, a circle which intersects the diagrams in two points implies that one of the k1 or k2 is like this. This is this can be k1 also. Yeah. Okay. Yes. The second question is from. Uh, uh, sorry, Mahanta. I think I, already, I asked the question, so uh, it was just a repeated one. Like before asking, I typed it. So sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, man. Okay. Yeah. So there is a question by Deepa, I think. Yes. It says, is there any known bound on number of numbers of prime knots with n crossing? Uh, th th there is a there is a, 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 a simple bound just coming from the number of four valent graphs. But what happens is that if you just take the number of four valent graphs on n vertices. Um, a four valent planar graphs on n vertices, um, that bound is uh, very, very big because then the, many of these may not even be knots with one component. There is the component issue. Then the second issue is that there may be lots and lots of repetition. Uh, there's a third issue about primeness and so on. So that's, a, that's kind of an uh, uh, easy bound. But if you want a little bit more sharper bound, which takes into uh, account some knot theory, then that is that is harder to do. It, it is harder to f estimate that that thing. I, I forget uh, what the current estimates are, but that's a harder question. I don't remember what the what the answer is. That's a good question. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to add a note with the stabulation, which uh, which uh, Tate and Kirkman and Little did over 25 years. They only had one error, which is quite amazing. So in 1974, uh, Ken Perko discovered a duplication in uh, the Tate Little tables. Now it is called the Perko pair. So um, uh, so they missed only one knot in about 600 or so knots. Um, uh, and and everything was done by hand and no invariants, mind you. Ba back then there are no invariants. They are just kind of maybe taking ropes and and moving things around or looking at graphs and seeing if they can actually move move one to the other. So no invariants. So quite quite an amazing effort, and um, uh, with only one error. All right. So uh, of course, when when you see lots and lots of examples, uh, you it's it's natural that patterns will start developing. And so Tate also, with all of his work, uh, he saw lots and lots of patterns arise. And one of his um, uh, observations was that any reduced alternating diagram of a knot has the fewest number of crossings. Uh, so what's a reduced uh, uh, alternating diagram? A reduced alternating diagram means you have no crossings, which is a reducible crossing, something like this. So you can see that in this, uh, this crossing can be, uh, can be very easily eliminated just by flipping over this diagram. So, uh, so something like uh, if you... So this is a reducible crossing. So if you have reducible crossings, it's just going to add up a bunch of uh, bunch of the crossings. 
without really any significant knottedness. So you have to remove this uh, uh, reducible crossing. So a reduced alternating diagram is a diagram which has no reducible crossings. And uh, then the number of crossings is the crossing number of a knot. So, he, so uh, this state conjecture, it solves the crossing number question for alternating knots, which is really fantastic because if you remember to find a crossing number, it's the minimum number of crossings taken or an infinite set, all knot diagrams. And in general, it's a very difficult problem to solve. But, uh, but Tate uh, conjectured from his observations of playing around with so many knots that, uh, hey, if you're reduced and alternating, then you cannot reduce it. You cannot do any, make any changes to the diagram to reduce the crossings. Uh, he, had, he had two more conjectures. Uh, one was about what is called the writhe, but the third conjecture um, uh, talked about how to equate how to equate two reduced alternating diagrams. And he said that the two reduced alternating diagrams are, uh, are related by a sequence of what are called flip moves, so which is called a Tate flipping conjecture. Tate flipping conjecture. And uh, the Tate's first conjecture uh, about, about the crossing number of alternating knots was independently proved by Lou Kaufman, uh, Murasugi, and Thistlewit in 1987 uh, using, using uh, diagrammatic techniques using the Jones polynomial. Um, and the geometric proof, which did not use uh, anything related to the Jones polynomial, was only recently given in 2017 by Josh Green. So um, you can see it took about 100 years to resolve state's conjecture. But in that, uh, there was a lot of topology which was being done on, on knots. And this is the subject of uh, the talk tomorrow. We'll talk about the topology of the knot complement. And all of those topological techniques uh, were not able to resolve this uh, very nice diagrammatic question. And it had to wade into some big sort of uh, jump in the diagrammatic theory of knots, which is uh, which was given by a Jones polynomial, in order to do this. Of course, now there is a, a geometric proof of that, uh, which, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's let's see a, a simpler way of determining uh, or distinguishing two knots. Um, uh, let's say if you, if we don't know other than the knot tables that a trefoil is actually a different knot than the unknot. A trefoil is not the unknot. So uh, we have this idea of tricolorable knots. So if you take a strand of a knot diagram, which just means uh, it's an edge from one undercrossing to the next. So, so something like this. Uh, this is a this is a strand, and it can go over a bunch of strands. So that's that's a strand. And the tricolorable, if it has a diagram such that each the, the strands can be colored using three colors, uh, such that at every crossing, uh, you are going to have three colors which are going to come up. There is a second color, and then there is a third color, like that. So that is a, at every crossing you either have this or it's monochromatic, meaning that it just all of them have same color. And um, it's, a, it's a nice exercise uh, uh, to show that tricoloring is preserved under the three Rydermeister moves. So let me note that um, in order to get not invariants, one can of course try to work from the embedding of the circle in three space and work around that part, which would give us kind of topology of the knot complement. But the other way to do a work is to look at knot diagrams and try to come up with quantities which are invariant under Rydermeister moves. So if you have a quantity which is which does not change under Rydermeister moves, then it's a knot invariant because then it will be same on equivalent knots because any diagram, any two diagrams of equivalent knots are related by Rydermeister moves. So if you are able to uh, find something which is preserved under the rider master moves, then it is a not invariant. So here is a tricoloring. If you take a tricoloring, then uh, uh, you can see 
uh, under the rider master one move it's going to be preserved because of course um, this can only be colored in one way because this is the same strand kind of going under um, for rider master two move uh, of course, if these are same color, then there is no issue. But if they are different colors, then then um, once you do the Rider Master 2 move, you can see that you can color this little strand in a, in a different color so that at every crossing, there are three colors which come up. So if your knot can be uh, tri-colored with three different colors, then uh, and you change the diagram under Rider Master 2 or 1, it is still tri-colorable. Uh, and here is uh, the move under the Rider Master 3. Uh, this is, uh, again, every crossing you can see is tricolorable. And if you move this strand like this right over the crossing, then you can also kind of extend the tricoloring, meaning that, again, at every crossing, it either has three distinct colors or the same color. So every knot has at least, of course, uh, uh, three monochromatic colorings. This is the same. You use this. Just this, use the same color uh, for all the strands. So we say that a knot is tricolorable if it has uh, more than three colorings, and the unknot is not tricolorable, right? Because you have no crossings, and then you cannot use any. You. you it's only monochromatic. Uh, you cannot use any different colors, and so. Uh, for any given knot, either every diagram is tricolorable because every diagram, any two diagrams are related by rider master moves, or none is. So here is the tricoloring of the trefoil. This is a tricolor coloring. You can see at every crossing there are four, uh, three colors coming in, and here is the unknot, which is of course not tricolorable, and so they are not the same knots. And a, a good question or a good uh, exercise would be to show that uh, or to to check if figure eight not is tricolorable. All right, so the next part is going to be um, a knots and graphs. Uh, so there's a very deep relationship between um, knots and graph theory by this uh, construction uh, of state. Abhijit, Shamik has raised his hand. Yes. Shamir, mm -hmm. please go ahead. Uh, Avijit, uh, is every yes. knot, uh, knot diagram four colorable? Uh, knot diagram, every knot diagram is four colorable. Well, um, you can see the trefoil cannot be colored with four because it has only three strands. Uh, no, as in an upper bound. Uh, in, I mean, we are only asking tricolorable or not. I was just wondering. Uh, yeah, Upper yeah, yes. So, so the question what you are uh, implying or pointing to is the n colorability of knots, and the n color colorability of knots is a very nice question. These are called Fox colorings, and that is uh, that is uh, studied, and those are actually related to representations of the knot group to the dihedral group. Yes. So there is a there is a very nice subtle underlying thing for colorability. You can yes. convert that into 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 uh, 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 representations are, are um, uh, of, of the knot group onto other groups. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. So that your, your answer is no, it's not every knot is four colorable, but you can ask the question if it is not is n colorable. And you can do that by studying this representations of the knot group on the dihedral group. Okay. They're uh -huh. called Fox and uh, Fox colorings. Okay. So coming back to this um, uh, uh, trade graphs, if you take a crossing, then you can you can take a checkerboard coloring of a of a uh, of a knot diagram, which just means like so that you are shading the regions um, uh, when the regions are not adjacent. So at a crossing, you shade the opposite regions, and then the shaded regions correspond to vertices, and the unshaded regions uh, and the and the crossings correspond to edges. So if you if you uh, make a graph like this, you can see this is exactly this graph here. And the same way, um, but there is one more thing which we need to add. It's not enough to just get a planar graph. You actually need a sign on the crossing. So the sign on the crossing is assigned as follows. If you take the over crossing with your right hand and and uh, sweep the area to the under crossing, that, if that is shaded, 
like like or here you actually say that this is a positive crossing uh as opposed to if you take uh, if if the if the left hand if you sweep from over crossing to under crossing if that is shaded using the left hand then you call it a negative crossing so you can actually assign sign so you get a signed uh, uh, you get a signed planar graph uh, like this so this is a a plane sign graph which just means that it's a planar graph with an embedding in the plane yeah i think buddha dev has a question Buddha, yes. please go ahead. Hello. Uh, hello. Hi. So I have yes. a question. If we change the color, means uh, the in replacing uh, black with white, then graph yes. will be the change. Ah, uh, yes, that's a very good question. That was my. That was going to be my question for the audience. So I will. Yes. So the question is that uh, you can see that uh, there are there are two checkerboard colorings. One, you if you if you look at the unbounded face, if that is shaded or unshaded. So if you take the other coloring, other checkerboard coloring, then what which, what's the graph which you get? So you can think about that. Um, also, let me point out that for uh, if you are given a graph, then you can. to reconstruct the knot back by using the medial construction which means that if you are given a graph and i am not put in signs over here but um, uh, you can put a crossing here depending on what the sign is and you can put a crossing and then uh, at every edge and now you can you can um, uh, attach the crossings in a unique way inside every face and that gives you a knot um and then you can again checkerboard color it and get back the graph so this interplay between knots and graphs kind of is uh, or knots and plane sign graph is very nice using this medial construction and the tate construction also note that uh, a link diagram is alternating if and only if all of its uh, uh, all the edges of its tate graphs have the same sign uh, and that that's that simply because if you are alternating uh, you you go like this and this is a shading and then when you when you draw an edge so here uh, it's always going to be uh, is always going to have the same sort of uh, the over strand going to the under strand is going to sweep the shaded area so that is the reason why uh, alternating knots correspond to tate graphs with the same sign and so the question is that why can every knot diagram be checkerboard colored and uh, what graphs do we get if you use the other checkerboard coloring so here is an example of another uh, not invariant uh, uh, which is a very classical invariant but it was one of the first computable invariants what i mean by computable means that it was not defined as minimizing over the set of all diagrams and so uh, this is called a determinant and we'll see a definition tomorrow when we do the topology uh, uh, that it's actually a determinant of some matrix it can be obtained from the famous polynomial invariants the jones and the alexander polynomials and uh, it's actually the number of spanning trees of the of the tate graph for alternating diagrams so if you are alternating diagrams the tate graphs have the same sign and you can actually just count the number of spanning trees of the graph and that gives you a, a gives you a not invariant and you can see that it has some topology in it it has some diagrammatics in it so it has many different points of view it's a very nice and classical invariant so the question is what is the determinant of the figure 8 not so let's get back to the tate conjecture and how it was solved so um, uh, it uh, the proof had to wait about 100 years for the discovery of the jones polynomial so von jones pictured here Uh, used the representation theory of braid groups and discovered a jones polynomial in 1984 and what happened was around the same time uh, there were very related discoveries in algebra and representation theory uh, i what are called quant the discovery of quantum groups by drinfield and this resulted in a theory of quantum invariance of knots uh, which a kind of used diagrams in a very very intrinsic way so jones polynomial is actually one of the quantum invariants the first kind of simplest quantum invariant but then th those can be generalized in many ways um um and uh, so that that is what kind of gives the gives us a whole sort of quantum side to 
uh, not theory. And then Edward Witten related this uh, whole quantum invariant stuff to topological quantum field theory. And that's when physics kind of got involved again in not theory. So all of these three people, Drinfield, Jones, and Witten actually got Fields medals. So this is very interesting. In the same year, in 1990, they all got Fields medals. And uh, uh, these are their, for their works, which somehow or the other related to not theory. Jones for the Jones polynomial, Witten for the, the, the topological quantum field theory, and um, Drinfield for quantum groups. And, and somehow all of that was kind of mixed up for years to come. So it's a very, very active area of research. So let's define the Jones polynomial uh, here. Well, right now I'm just going to give you some properties of the Jones polynomial. It's a Laurent polynomial uh, with uh, coefficients z in square root t and uh, one hour square root t, and it, it satisfies this Kane relation. So uh, the Kane relation means that uh, uh, what's important is that we define it for an oriented knot. So uh, you have a direction in which you we, you walk around, and uh, you have these three sort of situations. You have this one crossing, uh, the there is the positive crossing, or here the over strand to the under strand is right-handed, the over strand to the under strand is left-handed, and then this is the unique resolution which preserves the orientation. Then these three local moves, if you change this locally, this is how the Jones polynomial changes. So this enables us to compute Jones polynomials uh, for for say knots in the knot tables. Uh, and what's important about it was, it was the first polynomial knot invariant to uh, distinguish between the right and left trefoils, which we saw earlier. It's a difficult problem to uh, uh, to uh, distinguish them and, and everything which knot theorists did before, all of the sort of, well, you could distinguish them, but not with simple invariants. And so um, uh, the, their Jones polynomials are actually different. And the big open problem is, does the Jones polynomial detect the unknot? Meaning that if the Jones polynomial is one, is K the crossingless circle? Uh, the corresponding question for links or links or knots with more than one component uh, is known that it does not detect. So you can have uh, links with, uh, uh, with K components which have the same Jones polynomial as the trivial link, but they are, they are non-trivial links. And so uh, uh, Jones used the representation theory, a combinatorial uh, approach was uh, uh, discovered by Kaufman very soon after Jones came up with his definition. And that is that of a, of a smoothing. So you, you start with a knot diagram and you do two smoothings uh, locally at every crossing. This is what is called the A smoothing. And this is called the B smoothing. So um, again, you can see if you take the over strand and if you go uh, over the under strand with your right hand, the, a, the region that it spans, that's what the A smoothing kind of frees up. And well, with the left hand over strand to under strand, that region is kind of connected by the B smoothing. So this is how the Kaufman bracket polynomial, it's a Laurent polynomial in a variable A, that is how it changes. And if you have uh, uh, just an unknot, uh, union D, just disjoint union, uh, then um, then this is what uh, uh, you can just pull out the factor of delta, which is uh, negative A uh, squared minus one upon A squared, and uh, the value at the unknot is one. So you kind of can inductively compute Kaufman bracket. And the, uh, what's, what's, what's very interesting about this simple definition is that you can straight away prove that this is uh, invariant under the Rydermeister moves almost. Meaning that if you look at the second Rydermeister move here, uh, you can see these are the, the, there are two crossings. So there are going to be four resolutions locally. This is what they look like. And if you look, if you look at the contribution, Fusions to it, so a times a times the polynomial of what what's there, and delta a times a inverse with the polynomial. So uh, all of this is just added in and multiplied by uh, the 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 polynomial of the uh, the diagram on the on the outer side, and so you can see that they just add up to this adds up to just uh, uh, this just adds up to zero. So it means that under Rydermeister move, well, this, this thing is the same thing as the Kaufman bracket for this. 
means that the Kaufman bracket is invariant under the Rydermeister 2 move. And the same thing you can show for Rydermeister 3 move. If you look at the Rydermeister 3 move, then again there are there are these three crossings. But let's just resolve. Uh, let's resolve this crossing over here on one side. This is the Rydermeister move. And let's resolve this crossing on the other side. So you don't even have to resolve uh, it to eight eight resolutions because once you resolve it, you actually get uh, an R2 invariant. So there is an there is an R2 here which comes in, and there is an R2 here which comes in, and and this strand this is the same diagram. This is just isotopy. So you can see since it is invariant under R2, it's also invariant under the Rider Master three move. So what happens to Rydermeister 1? So let's define the rise of a diagram with orientation as the sum of sine at a crossing, which is counted as this is a positive crossing, the over strand going to under strand um, uh, with, this, uh, with this orientation, and, under strand going, uh, and, and the over strand going to under strand with left. So this is right, uh, which is positive, and which is left, which is negative. So that's how you, co you compute a ride. And then if you do this for a, for a rider master one, so let's just put some orientation here. So you can see that uh, this, is a, this is a negative crossing. This is negative. And uh, uh, this of course will just give you the bracket. And here you are going to get the delta of the bracket. Uh, sorry, uh, I should do A times. And this is going to be a inverse times this. So if you do this, uh, you can you, you you see that you will you are going to get a negative a to the power negative uh, to the power negative three factor with this, which means that you need to adjust with this. You need to adjust with this uh, this this monomial, and so. Uh, if we normalize with the rise accordingly, we actually get a not invariant. And so Kaufman proved that if you if you take the Kaufman bracket and multiply with this monomial coming from the rise, just normalizing for the rise, and then you do a substitution, you do a substitution of t equal to a to the power negative four, you get the Jones polynomial of the not. So this is a this is a, the the Kaufman's definition of the Jones polynomial. Ajit, could you tell me how much time I have? Yeah, so you have uh, what nine minutes? Okay, all right. And uh, there is one question uh, from Deep: Is there any connection between Kaufman bracket polynomials and elliptic, elliptic curves? And and what? Elliptic elliptic curves. <clears throat> uh, uh, elliptic curves and Kaufman bracket? No, mm -hmm. I I don't know of any connection. So. Um, I've, the, another way to visualize uh, uh, the Kaufman bracket is actually see all possible states of the diagram means that you smooth all crossings into either A or B. And since there are two choices for every crossing and there are N crossings, suppose you get two to the power N states. Now what's a state? A state is just a cross, a union of crossingless circles. You'll see a picture in a minute. And now we know uh, suppose you have A uh, uh, and B are the number of A and B smoothing respectively, and S is the number of loops or number of circles in the state, then that particular state is going to contribute this amount to the Kaufman bracket, right? This is your A factor and this is your delta factor. And so you, if you sum over all the states, then you get what is called a state sum um, of, of for the Kaufman bracket. This is called a state sum. So how does it look? So here is the trefoil. And, um, and here are the resolutions. You take this crossing, you resolve into A and B. So you can see this is A and B. And then you take the remaining crossings and you resolve each of them. And finally, you get this eight states. Now, if you keep track of what the, what the state sum, what every state is contributing. So for example, uh, something like this, it's A, 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 so that's A cubed. And then there, is, there are two circles, which means it contributes a delta because it's delta times a circle and circle is one. So that way you can just write this down. So for example, here, a B just means it's A inverse. 
and so this is a to the power negative three and there are three circles so that is delta squared so if you actually um if you if you add up all of these things uh oh let's also just compute the rise of this so if you just orient this knot like so you get the ride uh, to be uh, three this is the right trefoil and if you sum up all of these things then you get a to the power five and you normalize by the ride so you are you are normalizing this by uh sorry this part to the bracket and you get negative a to the power negative 16 uh, plus a to the power negative 12 plus a to the power negative 4 and and now if you do the substitution then you get your jones polynomial as t plus t cubed minus t to the power 4 which was the jones polynomial of the right trefoil so uh, in in the few in the few minutes i have remaining let me just quickly go through uh, how you can recover the jones polynomial using spanning trees so um, if you if you look at what our smoothings are doing right so So this is your A and this is your B smoothing. And if you now uh, look at, if you now look at your Tate graph, which and has an edge like this, what happens? And of course, there are more stuff here going on. So what happens over here? You are you are contracting the edge. So this edge is just contracted over here, and here you are altogether deleting the edge. I should not. This is how the coloring is. So, so, so what this is, this is uh, contraction and deletion. That is what they correspond to on the Tate graph, a contraction and deletion. And so, so if you restrict to alternating knots, which corresponds to graphs, we can actually use tools from graph theories, which have a, a whole tradition of defining polynomials using a contraction deletion property. So one such example is the Tut polynomial, which is a very famous polynomial, uh, and it has a spanning tree expansion. So what you do is you kind of, it's a two variable polynomial, and for every spanning tree, you assign a monomial. So this is a monomial, and how is the monomial assigned? Uh, you pick a ordering of the edges and then there is something called activity of every edge corresponding to uh, what is the order of the edge and what is the cycle and or the cut or something and so uh, there is some graph theoretic sort of activity and you get a number for every edge of that spanning tree and now you kind of you you um, uh, you you get a number for uh, every spanning tree depending on how many internally active and externally active edges are there and that's what the third polynomial is and so uh this took this third polynomial and defined the jones and gave a definition of the jones polynomial as a specialization of the third polynomial this is only for alternating so what are we getting now we are getting the we are getting uh, the Jones polynomial as a sum or the spanning trees of the Tate graph uh, of monomials, right? So, so remember that the Kaufman bracket was not a state sum of uh, 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 was not a sum of monomials. It had lots of cancellations, uh, but here now we are actually getting monomials. And so here is an example. Uh, here is a figure eight. Here is the diagram of a figure eight. Here is the Tate graph. And here are the spanning trees. Note that there are five spanning trees. And uh, this is what is called the activity. You compute the activity, and then you assign the particular monomial. And now you just add up the monomials, and that's your Kaufman bracket. 
and uh, now you can get the jones polynomial from there so that's the that's the idea of spanning trees and uh, monomials so what is happening in terms of the smoothing idea which you are which you are doing so when you start smoothing the crossings uh, say for example in figure 8 not you will you would get 16 states but in this distilled red idea, you don't go all the way to till you get a union of circles. You stop at what is called a twisted unknot. A twisted unknot is just a diagram of the unknot with some crossings. So here you can see you, uh, you, you can take some rider, do some rider master one moves and reduce this all to the unknot. So these are your twisted unknots. And the twisted unknots are actually one to one correspondence with spanning trees so twisted on knots uh, of of k and these are spanning trees of the tate graph so the twisted on knots are in one to one correspondence in spanning trees and and moreover uh, if you look at what actually what's the weight you assign for this the 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 kaufman weights correspond to the kaufman weights for this whole Kaufman bracket here, well, this is an unknot, so it's a, just a monomial. So Kaufman weights here, they correspond to exactly uh, the tut weights uh, with the with with x is equal to t and y is equal to one over t. So that's that. What what that gives us is a uh, the Kaufman bracket as a sum of monomials. These are all monomials um, or, uh, or the number of spanning trees. So now we, are, we have obtained the Kaufman bracket as a sum of monomials. Um, so here is an example of just the, just, the, just the skein tree for the trefoil. And what we stop is here is one, one twisted on knot. Here is another twisted on knot. And here is a third twisted on knot. So these are the three spanning trees. And of course, there are three spanning trees. This is just a triangle graph. This is a triangle graph. And so there are three spanning trees and this corresponds to these three twisted on knots. And so the idea for the spanning tree expansion is that instead of going all the way down to, to uh, all the states, you actually just stop at twisted unknots because the bracket of the twisted unknot, it is just going to be a monomial. This is a this is some kind of ride uh, computation, right? This is something to the right of this unknot. And then you can just add monomials. So using that thistle which showed uh, that if your D is reduced an alternating diagram, then the Jones polynomial is an alternating polynomial and the span of Jones polynomial is the number of crossings, which immediately gives us the Tate conjecture because now uh, you for a, for any I'll reduce alternating diagram they have the same number of crossings and you cannot get any lower because it's coming from an invariant of a knot called uh, the 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 Jones polynomial so uh, so the the Jones the span of the Jones polynomial which is an invariant of a knot is now equal to a diagrammatic quantity so that diagrammatic quantity is an invariant so that is really the the for alternating knots really very beautiful and immediately it gives you a way to detect if you have if a knot is non alternating because you just find the jones polynomial if it is non if if it does not um, uh, uh, change sign at every co coefficient then it is non alternating so um, uh, the lastly i just wanted to indicate the computational aspect of knot theory is rich and vibrating and so uh, there, there is, there is, uh, uh, there are many, many databases uh, which keep on increasing day by day as newer invariants are discovered. And so there are, there are many programs and databases which do this. So not theory is a mathematical package by Drawer Barnatton, and uh, uh, it also includes all the not censuses. And uh, the corresponding site, not at last, uh, lists a lot of information about knots and diagrams and invariants and so on. And similarly, not info by uh, Livingston, uh, Cha and Moore, uh, that also has a similar thing, uh, a lot knots and, um, and diagrams and lots of invariants. Computop is a website for just computational stuff with low dimensional topology surfaces, three manifolds, uh, hyperbolic three manifolds, 
uh, mapping class groups and all kinds of things, uh, the programs, they list a bunch of programs, although some of them may be defunct. So there are there were these very beautiful programs which I used maybe about 20 years ago. It's called Notscape by Hoste and Thistlewit and not by Kodama. But now they are kind of defunct because they haven't been keeping up with the various changes in compilers and packages and so on. So um, here are some references. The Notebook by Colin Adams is really an excellent, excellent reference. And I have a lot of the pictures I've used in my talk come from Colin's book. And uh, then there are these other beautiful books. Uh, uh, Knots and Links by Dale Rolfson is another classic. It has a lot of three manifolds and topological approach to knot theory, which we'll see later on. And uh, uh, the, these are more kind of involving topology and diagrammatics. And there are some uh, nice articles. There are also videos. And uh, uh, there is a handbook of knot theory edited by Menasco and Distilduit. And many, I think most of the articles in the handbook of knot theory are available on the archive. And they do, do kind of survey various aspects of knot theory, but they are also, uh, uh, they start elementary, but they also speed up uh, quite fast. So um, uh, yeah, image credits, call, uh, v uh, Google and Wiki, Wikimedia has lots of nice images. The knot table was done by Rob Sharon and not lot. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, uh, Professor Abhijit, for your very nice uh, introduction to knot theory. Okay, so if there are uh, some questions, we can take. Uh, <clears throat> you can raise your hand if you have any question. Yeah, Shamik. Um, so this is a little uh, offbeat, uh, this, but I mean, uh, you know, in some of the ancient architecture, these knots diagrams, some of them are there. I mean, is it uh, clear like in what connection? I mean, is there some idea about uh, why they were interested in these or, uh, I mean, I think possibly, I, 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 yeah. yeah, like uh, I think one conjecture is that uh, you know there are some treasures or something, and these are some clues for those uh, things. Oh, yeah. I have no idea. The only treasures I mine are uh, in not invariants. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do not know about about the other treasures and so on. But I think the knots which appear classically in Celtic art. Or, or in uh, in Islamic art, I think it's just aesthetically very pleasing. And there's you can draw pictures, and there's lots and lots of symmetry, and um, and uh, it's just aesthetics. I think aesthetics and art. And just one more question: uh, the like, uh, if you reflect the knot, I mean, uh, yes. is there is there some way like to see when they will be equivalent? Uh, yeah, well, one one um, uh, simple uh, uh, computation is that uh, the Jones polynomial, uh, uh, if you reflect the knot, it goes to one over t. So v of v k of t is equal oh. to uh, v uh, v of the reflected knot times one over t. Uh -huh. And so, if your if your knot polynomial, if your Jones polynomial uh, is um, is reciprocal, meaning that uh, if you replace by one over t, you will get the same polynomial back. Uh, then uh, there's a chance that the knot is uh, uh, the the knot is ampichiral, meaning that it is it is equivalent to its mirror image. And let me just show you that actually the figure eight knot is is ampichiral. The figure eight knot, uh, the Jones polynomial is reciprocal right here. If you replace yeah. this by one over t, you get the same polynomial. Uh -huh. There are there are there are two sort of more subtle questions uh, about whether you reflect the knot if it's equivalent knot or if you change the orientation of the knot 
uh, then what do you get and uh, and those are those are more subtle sort of properties they're they're, they're harder questions to answer <laughs> okay are there some other question maybe abhijit uh, since uh, uh, i believe there are a lot of uh, students who are aspiring to do phd and say let us say some of them if they want to work in uh, north theory what kind of background uh, do they need in order to get into this and how active is this uh, research area yeah this this is a very very active research area uh, uh, and it's very much related to uh, low dimensional topology which studies mainly surfaces and three manifolds and surfaces in three manifolds and also now more and more related to geometric group theory so this whole thing uh, uh, geometric group theory uh, uh, surfaces in three manifolds and knots they are kind of um, uh, they, 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 there's a lot of overlap between these fields and uh, now uh, by low dimensional topology i mean uh, topology and geometry in uh, geometric topology what is called in dimensions two three and four so we are looking at um, surfaces three manifolds and four manifolds and uh, there are there is a lot of activity in in not theory i will mention some of it uh, tomorrow uh, what are the recent sort of uh, uh, the big sort of uh, uh, research boost uh, uh, about, uh, something came about 20 years ago in form of homology theories the kavano homology and the and the uh, higard floor homology which kind of categorified uh, the jones polynomial and the alexander polynomial respectively and they also happened around the same time uh, so um, uh, so there is a lot of uh, lot and lot of uh, uh, research in that uh, another aspect is of course quantum invariance and the connection of quantum invariance to uh, to geometric and topological invariants. Uh, there is a lot of research in that. Uh, 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 another area which is coming up uh, and which is also very popular for another uh, 20 years or so, and I'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow, is that of virtual knots and knots in thickened surfaces. So uh, you, you kind of, you have a knot and uh, instead of going planar, at every crossing, somehow you kind of assign a virtual crossing. So you are kind of skipping it in the plane, but you are somehow going, uh, uh, you are imagining that there is a surface, a bridge you are going over. Not exactly a crossing as such, but but somehow a three-dimensional idea. Those are called uh, virtual knots and and which are very intrinsically related to knots in thickened surfaces. And so uh, the geometry of knots in thickened surfaces uh, recently, like in the last, two, three years, four years, uh, that field is kind of picking up a lot. So uh, the, the references I gave um, uh, about, about uh, uh, the knot book by Colin Adams is a very wonderful, uh, uh, easy initial read. It has a lot of exercises. It gives a very good overview and it also actually has uh, some proofs. Uh, but if you want to study something more, you can take licorice as an introduction to knot theory. Uh, most of these books will go over re recent books will go over the basic ideas a little bit topology a little bit of uh, 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 group theory of knots alexander polynomial jones polynomial dale rolson's book is an older book so it does not do the jones polynomial it was written before the jones polynomial okay any other question maybe i'll uh... Last question, one more question from me. Yeah, so uh, do, uh, I mean, uh, have they observed some uh, kind of uh, patterns of knots in space? No, well, the, is, there is no either in space, so there was no <laughs> knots. So that kind of theory kind of fizzled out pretty soon. Okay. But, but there's a lot of physics which comes into knot theory because of this whole quantum topo uh, to, uh, the, uh, topological quantum field theory. Yeah, TQFTs. Okay. Uh, I, I should just mention, I asked a bunch of questions and uh, should I go over the answers or should I let it be? What should I do? Uh, maybe, I mean, if you want to give a quick uh, answer a few of them, fine. You can have another two, three minutes. Yeah, so uh, our, 
a composite not special case uh, yes they are you just take a uh, you just put a knot in the solid torus uh, where this one strand goes around the solid torus and then if you just do the satellite construction you exactly will get uh, the composite knot the components of tpq that is related to the gcd if p and q are co prime then there is only one way to come back so the number of the components is just the gcd uh, how is tpq related to tqp that is a more uh, there's a nicer more topological question that relates to the fact that uh, s3 the three sphere can be decomposed as a union of two tori two solid tori and so there is the horizontal <coughs> solid tori right over here and um, uh, that's the that is the horizontal one and that is the vertical one and so s3 is 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 uh, a union of two solid tori and this is a this is a very fundamental fact and uh, and what happens is that the meridian of one becomes a longitude of the other and the longitude of one becomes the meridian of the other so because they flip so our normal picture we draw this pq curve like this but if you take this pq curve and see instead of on the other tori it becomes a qp curve so these tpq and t QP are actually equivalent. And the figure eight knot is not tricolorable because there are four strands and um, um, uh, the three of them meet at all the four crossings. So uh, you want to choose three, four choose three is four, and those are four crossings. So you cannot uh, assign three colors only because there'll be repetition somewhere. And um, if, why can every knot diagram be checkerboard color? Well, you can prove it using induction on the number of crossings, or you can note that the dual graph is actually uh, a square graph, meaning that every face of the dual graph is actually square. So dual, I, I just mean that if you look at the four valent graph of the knot projection, then just take the dual planar dual of that graph. And, um, and uh, if you have, um, if you have a, a graphs with even cycles, then they can be made bipartite. And so this bipartiteness actually gives you the whole coloring. So I think that is a theorem called Conic's theorem. And if you use the other checkerboard coloring, you get the planar dual of the Tate graph. And the determinant of figure eight is five because there are five span, spanning trees. All right. Okay, so uh, thank you very uh, much. Uh, I think Shamik has one uh, more question. Just, just yeah. one question. Uh, you know, there's one book on by AMS, uh, American Math Society, like uh, on quantiles. It uh, talks yes. about. So is this by, is it by uh, Sam Nelson? Yes, quantiles. Um, yes, quantiles is a um, algebraic structure which is assigned to knots. And uh, it is very much motivated by the Fox colorings, which we talked about, the tri colorings. And what mm -hmm. you can do is you can try to dig further and try to do kind of more sophisticated colorings, either by colors, or meaning that by colors you really mean uh, the 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 cyclic group Zn, or you can do dihedral groups, or you can do more sophisticated quandals. So quandals is an algebraic structure. Uh, which is pretty much like a group. It's like a group. It has a binary operation, but the axioms are slightly different. And it is a uh, th th there's a very influential theorem which says that uh, the knot quandle classifies the knot. But but it's very difficult to tell when two quandles are the same. And so they have been developing sort of lot of the structure and theory about quandles. Uh, but but the 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 it's 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 not clear how the quandle uh, theory. Uh, connects up to other aspects of knot theory. But it has a lot of reach because it generalizes to virtual knots and so on. So it's actually very popular. A lot of people uh, do research in condors. Okay, I think uh, uh, now it's time to thank uh, Professor Abhijit for uh, his lectures. And I think I, I should also thank uh, maybe for taking lead to represent the alumni MTTS alumni of 95 and 96. <laughs> Thank you, Abhijit. Thank you. Yeah, over to you, organizers.
with that we have come to the end of today's session i thank dr ajit kumar for being such a wonderful host for today's event thank you sir i would also like to thank dr abhijit champaneka for giving such an amazing talk today i hope that it has inspired our audience last but definitely not the least i would like to thank all the participants the audience thank you everyone so see you all tomorrow at 6 pm with the same zoom link thank you thank you very much to thank Karayi you all and organizers thank you to ajit for your very generous and kind comments and thank you to all the people who attended and asked so many interesting questions thanks a lot this was a very interactive audience and i was very very happy to answer all the questions thank you very much uh yeah so i would request the participant to uh, leave the meeting Samia, so, yeah, maybe uh, one can take a break of five minutes. Is that yeah, fine? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Vijit, you can also. Yeah, Jantan sir is also yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, we are we are doing it today, is it? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I thought it please. was. <laughs> so we'll be okay. back in four minutes or five minutes. Are you going to stop the live stream or?